Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm pleased to welcome the writer Rebecca Traster to the program. She's the author of Big Girls Don't Cry, the election that changed everything for American women. It's just been published by the Free Press. The election, of course, being the 2008 presidential election and all that led up to the actual voting that November. The book has received great reviews and even thoughtful ones, and they are so well deserved. The book is both personal and repertorial and insightful in every way. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, at the, the front of your book, you quote three women, Hillary Rodham from her commencement speech at Wellesley, Shirley Chisholm from her book, The Good Fight, written back in 1973, and Tina Fey on Saturday Night Live in 2001. Um, would you read one of them? Yeah. For me? Yeah. I'm going to read the Chisholm quote because I think it... Um it speaks most to the arc of the story that I'm trying to tell here and that we're living <laughs> still right now. Um, this was Shirley Chisholm who ran for president in 1972, ran for the Democratic nomination. Um, her campaign was in many ways largely symbolic, um, but she was the first to come even a little bit close to a major party nomination for the presidency, though she did not in fact come close. And she said in The Good Fight, the United States was said not to be ready to elect a Catholic to the presidency when Al Smith ran in the 1920s. But Smith's nomination may have helped pave the way for the successful campaign of John F. Kennedy waged in 1960. Who can tell? What I hope most is that now there will be others who will feel themselves as capable of running for high political office as any wealthy, good-looking white male. Because they have seen a woman, and a black woman in that case, running, and then later they saw Geraldine Ferraro on the ticket, mm -hmm. and uh, people who would say that, you know, we're not ready for it, get, get more accustomed to the idea. Yes, one of the things that I found when considering my own experience, and I opened the book with, with the memory of being taken to vote for the first time by my parents when I was nine, and, and I was taken into a voting booth so that I could pull the lever for Geraldine Ferraro. Mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't really, until this election came around and I began to think about it as a journalist, write about it, and then certainly writing this book, thought about the impact that that really does have um, when you see somebody in that role, the way it conditions you to be able to see them again, right. to see somebody like them again. And, and we forget that, um, what it is like to have had, up until very recently, 220 years of white male presidential history, totally uninterrupted until very recently, and still interrupted only once so far. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's interesting because I remember, you know, when, when Jackson made his two runs for the presidency, and, and the rhetoric among Democrats was, you know, he should drop out because he's ruining the chances, he's a spoiler, mm -hmm. he's ruining the chances for, you know, whatever Democrat might get the, uh, the nomination. And, and, and I'm thinking, you know, well, he has a, as much a right to run as anybody else, and there's only going to be one person nominated in the end, so how can he be a spoiler? Right. But that was, well, that and was what you heard. That's, that's electoral competition. That's, in fact, right. what our system is built on, right. is, is elections. <laughs> so there, is, whether or not it's a spoiler, you know, sort of strategically, this is, what, this is how we elect presidents, is right. people compete for their nominations. People then compete for the presidency. Um, and you saw a lot of the same rhetoric being deployed against Hillary Clinton during her very tough primary fight with Barack Obama, although there it was much more complicated because both of the candidates were outsiders as far as the uninterrupted history right. of white male power. So this is a book about the uh, 2008 election and the campaign leading up to it and how it altered the playing field for women in politics. Um, why did you write it? Uh, well, I wrote it. I didn't intend to write it when I was covering the, just the Hillary Clinton part of the primary. I was, I'd written about women in politics and the media and entertainment for Salon.com for seven years. And so I'd been covering Hillary's race um, with great interest, but I didn't think it was a book. And then, there, I mean, I hadn't really given any thought to it as a book. And there was so much antipathy toward Hillary, especially toward the end of her campaign, that the idea that anybody would still want to be talking about Hillary Clinton several years hence, you know, um, was lost on me. But then there was this moment, it was after Sarah Palin was nominated, and I was watching television, 
and I saw a pundit trying to explain, you know, why Sarah Palin means something to American women. Um, and they were getting it wrong. I don't remember from what angle they were getting it wrong. And I got frustrated and thought, oh, God, this is just wrong. They're not seeing the story. Don't they see this as an epic story? It's not just, you know, some little piece of, of electoral arcana. This right. is it, uh, the story of American women in politics. And something about Palin coming in and adding another act, which we now see are multiple acts, right. um, threw into sort of stark relief for me that this, this election um, actually provided, in addition to sort of a gripping narrative, because it was a totally gripping election, you never knew what was going to happen right. next, you woke up, you were surprised, your feelings changed, your heroes changed, um, but this ultimately one campaign cycle story provided a prism and a lens through which women's history in America um, became visible to us for the first and and something that we talked about for the first time in years in complicated, nuanced, often difficult ways. And also, it was an election story that is altering the future. It's altering our present right now when mm -hmm. we talk about Palin and Mama Grizzlies and the Republicans as party of women, when we talk about the demonization of Nancy Pelosi, when we talk about, as I sometimes do, the failures of the Democrats to sell themselves as the party of women. Um, we're also talking about issues that sort of exploded in the 2008 cycle. And so um, I think I wrote the book because suddenly that story just came into relief for me. And I thought, my God, this is a tremendous story, not just about one election. It's a story about American history and American social progress that extends backwards and is right. obviously going to extend forward. Why the title, Big Girls Don't Cry? Well, the title, funnily enough, um, literally that day I was sitting on the couch getting angry at a pundit. Um, a friend called me and I sort of said in an incohate way, I'm thinking of writing a book. <laughs> it was really an idea that came upon me. And the friend said, oh yeah, Big Girls Don't Cry. It was, it was the day that I thought of writing the book that a friend suggested the title to me. And it absolutely caught my attention and its most obvious referent was the infamous moment at which Hillary did not technically she didn't even, she shed didn't even tears, <laughs> but which in which she was um, widely reported to have, you know, bawled like a baby. Right, right. And so it, it struck me as a very ironic, you know, funny, here was, Hillary is the biggest girl of them all in right. many ways. Um, and she was tagged as a crier. Um, but the, the funny thing is, so I, I proposed the book that way. I sold the book with this title. And then as I reported the book, one of the things that became clear to me, almost everyone in this book cries. I cry. Uh, Sarah Palin cries. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro cries. Many, many of the people I talked to, many of the women that I talked to, reported in the sort of conversations that we had or started to cry themselves, remembering the difficulties and complexities of the election and right. the choices they had to make. So, in fact, the title became weightier mm -hmm. um, as I reported the book, and there were all these instances of these very tough, very smart women crying. Um, and so there's there's actually a point in there where I ponder the relationship between tears and politics, and that's how the title became a little more resident than okay. I even knew it would be. So let's talk about Hillary Clinton, who is really the main character of the book. Mm -hmm. There are other subsidiary characters. Uh, the country has always had a very complicated relationship with Hillary. Mm -hmm. And you, as you point out, it has always tended to hate her when she was up mm -hmm. and to like her when she was down. Yes. What's that about? Well, Gloria is that, and, is, and is that just the case with her? Or is that the case with all women, all, with all ambitious and uh, talented women? Well, I think that's historically often the case with ambitious and talented and rule-breaking women. Uh, Hillary Clinton was an explosive figure when she came into the American consciousness in 1991 when her husband was running for president. She was the first sort of candidate for first lady who had resembled uh, post-second wave America for, for American women, who often profoundly and uh, over tightly identified and connected with her um, because she was this first woman up for this very symbolic job. The, the first lady is supposed to represent some kind of ideal of American femininity and wifeliness. And here was a woman, the first ever, um, who had a postgraduate degree, the first who had maintained an independent career outside of her husband's political career. Um, she'd done this while raising a daughter, um, apparently at, at that point we could tell quite well. Um, and she was making comments about how she didn't stay at home and bake cookies. And this made her a lightning rod, and it made many women who 
whose lives resembled hers in that balancing act that is very much a, was very much a product of a post second wave feminist America. Um, really pay attention. So she became a, a lightning rod not only for um, the resentments and frustrations and anger of, of the kind of right and, and of conservatives who weren't so thrilled about the way that the country was changing for women, um, but also an object of intense love and identification uh, for many women. Uh, and then over the course, as she tried to carve out her own political career, which happened uh, slowly and circuitously, um, what you saw were those initial, the initial strength of those reactions get tempered and shifted because she did move so far to the right or to the center, I should say. Um, she did make all kinds of compromises. Um, there were all kinds of moments of ambivalence. And so a lot of the, as she somehow finagled a place where she could actually be taken seriously as a presidential candidate. And it's miraculous that she did. I mean, you know, the, the woman of sterling liberal character who could win Ohio is pretty hard to find, you right. know. Um, now, your feelings about her changed over the course of time. Oh, yes. Well, I went into the, the Clintons had, had entered the White House when I was a senior in high school. So I, my whole adult life, I had known of Hillary Clinton. She'd been, been in my consciousness. By the time I was in college, my roommate had already written a thesis on her. You know, she was already sort of an academic subject for me. I didn't feel that intense identification. She reminded me a bit of my mother, but aside from that, there wasn't that strength of feeling for her. Um, and I, I, her politics were too far to the center for me going in. I was an Edwards supporter, which is, you know, hard to admit in retrospect, but um, going into the 2008 election, I had no interest personally in supporting Hillary. I couldn't imagine myself ever voting for her. Um, and, uh, but I was writing about her because I was writing about gender and politics, and she was obviously a fascinating story. But then as the race went on, A, Edwards eventually dropped out, and B, I began to see Hillary was this incredibly... Uh, following her made me realize and, and see the strength of resistance that she was facing, not just from those right-wing louts who had always hated her, right. but in fact from my own progressive compatriots. And I did begin to feel a level of defensiveness that eventually wound up translating into an ambivalent vote for her on Super Tuesday. I was very torn between Hillary and Barack Obama. I thought they were very similar candidates. Um, I wound up voting for her in part because I didn't like the way that he was being lionized by my, by many of my like-minded peers right. and she was being demonized. And then by the end, as she continued her campaign and seemed to get stronger and stronger and faced this wall of fury and resistance that she wasn't dropping out, as, as you know, you drew the, the comparison to the way that people talked about Jesse Jackson, he's got to get out, he's spoiling it. Right. Hillary faced that, that spring full of that. By the end of that, I, I had actually become kind of radicalized in my support for Hillary, much mm -hmm. to my surprise, and ended the campaign an ardent Hillary supporter. But in the end, you, was, you were... You, did you say you were glad she lost yes. in the end? <laughs> uh, in retrospect, mm -hmm. I'm glad. I also was aware during the end of that very, very tough primary season, I thought it was great she stayed in the race, not just because I thought like everywhere she was transforming our vision of what a woman it, it might look like as she ran. She was just defying conventional wisdom. She was not listening to anyone. She was refusing to comply. I thought that was terrific for how we were seeing women in power. Um, I also thought it was good for the country that the race was going on and on. Everybody was saying it was going to destroy the Democrats, but every state I was going to, people were so thrilled that they still had a choice, that they were engaging, that it was laying down the groundwork for um, the system that was going to help elect Barack Obama. But even then, I knew she couldn't win. At that point, there was already too much conversation about Florida. Um, you know, it wasn't going to be clean. There was going to be so much resentment if Hillary had been the one to pull it out at the end, that even when I was the most ardent Hillary supporter, I couldn't foresee a path in which she actually won the nomination mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been terribly, terribly ugly. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to say I was an ardent Hillary supporter, but one who was not thinking or logistically hoping that she was actually going to win because it would have been a disaster. If she had gotten the nomination, she would have lost against John McCain? No, I thought she would have won. My, okay. my balance on that when people ask that question is I always thought that Hillary would certainly have won against McCain by probably a relatively narrow margin. Mm -hmm. And I thought Obama was a much bigger gamble that he would either cream McCain or lose very badly yeah. to him. I sort of thought Hillary was the consist consistently likely to win and that Obama might 
stage, a, it would be very dramatic whether okay. he won or lost. We're going to have to take a short break. Rebecca Traster and I will be back after the following message. Take out meals for just twelve ninety nine. Call it. Sherry Pearson. You are the sole surviving heir of the King of Montanopolis, and you are now worth $45 million. <gasps> I'm rich! This can't be real. Of course it's not real. Come on. Having money isn't about luck. Like that takeout meal. Cook at home instead, you can save thousands a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy at the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Rebecca Traster, the author of Big Girls Don't Cry, the election that changed everything for American women. It's just been published by the Free Press. Having to choose between a woman and a black as the next president presented a huge dilemma for a lot of voters, don't you think, including a lot of feminists? Yes, yes, because it was, like so much in history, it's like if a table has only been occupied by one kind of person and then one seat gets opened up at that table. And this is so sad that this is the way that power works. In fact, the people who've been shut out from that table of power wind up, you know, tussling with each other for that one seat. And you can see that through it repeated. This is a pattern that is repeated throughout history. Um, and it's one of the ways that those in power stay in, stay power, in power is by setting, you know, those outside of it against each other. When in fact, um, you know, obviously in this case, the very setup of the woman versus the black man or the, the, the woman versus the African-American um, was so distorted because, of course, how there are so many women who are both women and black. There are so many. I mean, and, and the histories of being shut out of power have always been so linked. Um, the histories for pushing toward progress have been linked. Going back to the cooperation and then the terrible split between abolitionists and suffragists prior to the Civil War and then after the Civil War as they split over um, the 14th and 15th Amendments. Right. And, um, and you can see it also through the history of the mid-20th century social movements, of the civil rights movement, anti-war movements, and, and eventually the women's movement, which in part sprung out of the failures of the other socially progressive movement to include women in right. their larger, um, larger noble aims for further equality. Um, so it was this very, and it, it was a tortured, tortured time because of course many on the left who'd spent their whole lives working toward furthered opportunity um, for women, for racial minorities, for sexual minorities, um, found themselves having to choose between two things that had been important to them right. all their lives and, uh, th and then being evaluated on that choice. Right. And I think a lot of blacks initially started out for Hillary yeah. because, you know, they, first of all, they liked Bill Clinton, yes. you know, they liked, liked what they were for, and also because they thought she had a better chance of, of winning, yes. you know, against the Republicans. And then when Obama started to catch, you know, catch on, uh, and he looked like he might be able to win, then they switched to Obama because maybe we can actually get, you know, maybe the bad guy can actually win after all. And that was true actually for a lot of feminists too. Like uh. feminists who you would have thought would get, were going to be in the bag for Hillary. In fact, uh, were not and put a lot of distance between themselves and Hillary at the start of the race, in part, again, because she had moved to the center in her bid to, to get to the place where she could run for president. And uh, something Gloria Steinem said to me when I was reporting the book is, you know, we tend to take our own experience, the hurts of our lifetime, and assume that they're going to apply so that people didn't actually think that somebody from their own particular group was going to be able to win. I don't think a lot of feminists, including Gloria Steinem, um, who told, tells me this in a book, thought Hillary could win. Right. But then as things, you know, then everybody found these things shifting and, and feeling themselves aware and seeing, and, and of course, many people also saw the racism um, that Barack Obama faced, and people saw the sexism that Hillary Clinton faced, and it, all of us were changing our minds daily, and we're experiencing kind of allegiances we maybe never thought we were going to experience. Right. So was the main legacy of the election and of that campaign the fact that Hillary Clinton put 18 million cracks in the glass ceiling that has kept women out of the White House. And those are her words when she was giving her concession speech. Is that the, is that the main legacy of the 2000s? I know there are a lot of legacies. There are a lot of legacies, and I think they tie together in, in one way, which is that I think what the 2008 
election did was and should do is make us throw out our conventional wisdom about who can win elections and how. And I'm frustrated now because I don't think that, um, I'm not sure that party leaders have absorbed this, but, but look at how Barack Obama won the presidency, in part with the votes of young people who've never been relied upon before, right? And Hillary Clinton had 18 million female supporters who had an estated appetite for uh, women and power. For, for female leadership. And that too has been, we've never, you know, the Democrats have not been any, you know, have, have not run enough women in the past, and Republicans have not, have run even fewer. Um, I think that part of what we should have gathered, and you could see it even in the daily reporting of the 2008 election, is that the old conventional wisdom, the old reliance on polls, they weren't coming through. Every night people were being surprised. And I think part of what we saw in 2008 was a nation that was so changed that we need to throw out the old scripts. That was part of, when Hillary Clinton started her campaign, she went to great lengths to not present herself as a woman because right. the wisdom was, we don't want to see, you know, a tough woman, a, a, woman, a self-proclaimed women's history maker, let alone a feminist. Um, she went to great lengths to sort of disguise herself as the practically the incumbent, which right. we now know worked against her. And it may not, I, I'm not saying that she would have won if she'd done it the other way. These things change as we go along. The elections themselves change us. But I think that, I think that we could now get rid of some of those assumptions about mm -hmm. we don't have an appetite for, for female leaders anymore. And, and that's something that the Republicans are doing a strange job of responding to. I mean, it's, that's very complicated, and they're really trying to rebrand themselves in a, in a false way. But Republicans seem to be hearing this and, and taking up the language and symbolism of feminism for the first time ever mm -hmm. in Republican and conservative history. Which brings us to the strange case of Sarah Palin, <laughs> you know, who I liked at first when she first burst out there when, when McCain nominated her. She was smart. She was dusty. She was confident. She was attractive. She actually did have some political experience. She brought some excitement to the campaign. And I said, uh-oh, maybe the Democrats better, better, mm -hmm. better watch out. And then, you know, she, she revealed herself to be a lightweight, and, and, and that started to, to take her down. Um, what, what are we to make of Sarah Palin? What was, what was her impact on the campaign? And, and of course, right now she's popular. Oh, yes. Immensely popular. The thing is, I don't know that any of us knows what to make of Sarah Palin. And this is what's so, this is part of what I talk about also when I say we need to throw out conventional wisdom. Because it certainly hasn't applied to Sarah Palin when she quit as governor halfway through her term. And I was in the middle of writing this book. I remember thinking, Oh God! Nobody's going to want to read about this woman in a year and a half because she's going to. If you quit your your governorship halfway through, and here you're she's not going to matter. Like, here she's and back she's like gangbusters. on the front of the papers. So the thing to make of Sarah Palin is that politics is proceeding in ways we've we've never seen before. And yes, she she may be a lightweight, but we cannot deny that she has power within her party, that she has a kind of charisma, um, an ability to sway people, though not, she's overcredited with, credited with it sometimes because some of the candidates that she supports, she's not a magic wand. She doesn't, she doesn't, you know, make or break candidates in the right. way that she's often credited with making or breaking candidates. But, but she has awakened on the right and amongst some women on the right, a desire to lay claim to the history of liber women's liberation that I find very fascinating. Um, that is one of her legacies. Um, the other is simply her leadership of this far right uber conservatism um, that we're now calling the Tea Party, but that is in fact a certain faction of the Republican Party. And, and Sarah Palin has made herself the sort of patron saint of that and the leader, but she's done it under the auspices of a feminism that she's trying to claim as her own. And that's causing problems not just as far as um, electoral politics go, but when you talk about how we're defining feminism. Right. And, and that's something I deal with in the book, too. Uh, this is a serious question for those of us who have long called ourselves feminists um, and who have pushed and pushed to make that tent bigger because, in fact, trying to represent women of all kinds of ages, races, uh, religions, ethnicities, sexualities, physical abilities means that it's, feminism is not an exclusive club with, with set rules. It's always a mashup of competing mm -hmm. priorities and perspectives. And so now there's an incursion, and in feminism, built of language, all, incursion, all incursions are allowable, but this incursion is coming from from the right, from a completely different ideological cast, and how do you process that? We've got one minute left. Do you think um, Palin got too much of the, bl of the blame for McCain's yes. loss? Yes. 
there was a fetishization of Palin that came both from right and left, um, and an interest in making her the scapegoat. Um, that's not to say that she didn't do harm to the campaign, but she obviously clearly has a political power of her own, and we do all of ourselves a great disservice in underestimating her. Fascinating. <laughs> And very, very complicated, yes. as, I, as I said. And it's going to be interesting, you know, the twists and turns that, that, that women have in this whole political process going forward. Uh, I want to thank Rebecca Traster for joining us today. Big Girls Don't Cry, the election that changed everything for American women has just been published by the Free Press for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.